Lord, everybody. Tonight we're moving on where we left off from last week. And just, just to catch you up on where we were last week, we were talking about um, judgment, God's judgment. Now this, this is something that, that pertains to us right now, but there is more to judgment than what we have, um, than what we have talked about previous. The next thing is dealing with the sonship, in the sonship is eternal judgment. And so we'll get into that uh, coming up. But right now we're just dealing with how the church judges matters today. In the book of St. Matthew, chapter number 16, I would like to take this into two different categories. One is dealing with salvation, and the other is dealing with uh, judgment itself, loosing and binding in judgment. And so, first we have Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 and 19, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So now here's, the, here's a term that's being used, or two terms, loosed and bound. And this is something that I don't want to call out any other denominations. Let me just say there are some that have taken this passage to mean that they have the authority to put someone in heaven or to keep them out of heaven. They can pray for you that God will let you go to heaven or they can pray that God keep you out and he'll do that. That is not true. This scripture is not talking about loosing blessings on people. Amen. It's not talking about binding the devil, binding somebody that's getting on your nerves. It's not talking about that. What he's dealing with is up to this point, up to the time of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, all mankind was bound in sin. All of us were. It didn't matter how much you loved God. It didn't matter how much you obeyed the law. Every single person was bound. The Bible says it like this. We were dead in trespasses and sins. All of us were. And so... Without the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, we didn't stand a chance. But God didn't just pour the Holy Ghost out on everybody all at once. Here, if you go to the book of Acts, scripturally speaking, there are Three groups of people that God, that God acknowledges. There's Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles. The Jews are the two tribes that remained after Rehoboam and Jeroboam split. They split the kingdom. Or let, me, let me just back up and give a little foundation real quick. These brothers, the, the, the first king was Saul. After Saul, David took over and he reigned. And then David's son Solomon took over after the death of David and he ruled. And then when Solomon 
died, his son, Rehoboam, took over. Solomon had taxed the people extremely heavy. And Jeroboam came to Rehoboam and said, give us a break. The people just need a break. Your father taxed us hard. He took from us so much. And he wasn't doing that for his own storehouse. Solomon had made Jerusalem an extremely wealthy city. Everything was beautiful. He was a perfectionist and a collector of fine things. That's why he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He collected women. Now, now that's offensive to us today, but that's what he was doing. You know, he didn't have no 700, 1,000 women living in the house with him. I mean, that, that's almost the village of Katsopolis, 1,700 of us. That's a whole lot of folks. So you know that's not what he was doing. But he, were, he collected things. Beautiful women, he collected those. People would come from other countries to see him. And when they came, they brought gifts. But Solomon, he built the temple. And when he did, it was, it was gorgeous when he got finished. One of a kind. Well... The people were very dissatisfied at this point now because of how heavily they've been taxed. And so Jeroboam came to represent the people. And he came to Rehoboam and told him, just give us a break. Well, he didn't listen to him. He didn't. So Jeroboam left and took 10 of the 12 tribes with him. The only two that was left was Judah and Benjamin. All the rest left. And that's how Israel and Judah split off and became two separate nations. Israel followed Jeroboam. Judah stayed and followed Rehoboam. So when you hear people today use terms like the Jews, that's what they're talking about, the descendants of Judah. Judah and Benjamin. That's what we see today. The other 10 tribes, they're still lost. They're still mixed in among the nations. You know who knows who they are? God does. He knows who every one of them is. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter is preaching to the Jews. In the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who is he talking to? The house of Israel. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, when he's talking here about that are afar off, Peter is not referring to the Gentiles. He's referring to the Jews that were lost. The, uh, not the Jews, the children of Israel. Israel, he's talking about Israel, the lost tribes. And, and you can find that, I believe it's in the book of Daniel. Go to the book of Daniel. Chapter number 9 and verse number 7. It says, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day. The men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel 
that are near and that are far off through all countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. Daniel here calls them the ones that are far off. Some are near and some are far. They were scattered. God drove them from his country, from his land. And remember, this is something that he told them. He warned them about this in the very beginning. He said, now when you get into the land that I have promised, don't you sin like the inhabitants sinned, or I will vomit you out. Uh, the land will vomit you out like it vomited them out. So God already warned them, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you'll be driven out the land. Well, that's exactly what happened. Because when they split off, Jeroboam said, now... If I let them go to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, they'll get homesick and they'll want to come back. And they'll leave me and they'll go back to Rehoboam. So he built other temples. And the Bible said that he chose men of a baser sort as priests. He got wicked men, vile men, and made them priests. And then God after he tried and he tried and he tried and he tried over and over to get them to straighten up, he finally drove them out. They're the ones that are far off. So Peter, we know that this is a prophecy concerning all the world. But when Peter preached this, he wasn't talking about all the world. And you can see that later on, but... Peter was simply talking to the Jews, those that are near and those that are far, all of Israel. How God is going to save them. And then he goes on and he says, For with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they gladly received his word, or then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now without going into too much detail, those 3,000 souls, another place, 5,000 souls, it says were added unto the church. And then there were others that received the Holy Ghost. So if we just do some loose math and say another 2,000, that's 10,000 of the Jews that received the Holy Ghost. But let's be generous. We can just double that number. Because it trickled, it slowly went down, it trickled down to them. So let's just, just for the sake of argument, say it doubled. That is what God calls the remnant. So compared to the Gentiles, no matter how many of them got saved, they are only the remnant of Israel. Amen. That's it. So we certainly have gotten the larger portion to this point than they did. That was the Jews that received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. It was another eight years before the Holy Ghost was poured out on the Samaritans. Yes, ma'am. You said the Jews were the remnant, not us? The Jews are the remnant, yes. There's far more Gentiles that have received the Holy Ghost than the Jews. So those that received it in the beginning and the sprinkling that has gotten it throughout time, throughout all the way up until now, that sprinkling, you add all of them together and they are only a remnant of, of uh, the Jewish people. Just a, just a small fraction. So... If you go a little bit further in the book of Acts to chapter number 8. Starting at verse number 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the city, in the same city, used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. So now, now we're talking about the Samaritans, right? Okay giving out that himself was some great one to whom 
they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Now just stop for a moment. Up to this point, they think that he is a great person. Right? That's what it says. Up to this point, they think he's great. They think he's the great power of God. He's fooled them into thinking that he's all that. But then something else happens. Verse 12, but when, uh, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, I just want to stop there for a moment. Just do a sidebar here. Does this say that they believe? It says that the people that Philip preached to believed concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus were they baptized, right? So they were baptized in the name of Jesus and they believed. And you hear a lot of churches teach that to be saved, all you got to do is believe. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Isn't that what the Bible says? He that believeth not shall be damned. So if you believe and are baptized, surely you're saved. Well, that's well but where is that scripture he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved does, any, does anybody know where that is he that believeth and is baptized alright open your bibles to mark 16 <laughs> he said he's just got it like that. Uh huh. There, yeah, that's that's what it is. Mark sixteen and sixteen. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, that, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah, that's 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 the problem. Shall be not are saved and the proof of that is here one of the proofs of that one of the proofs is here where it says they believe Philip preaching the things the things concerning the kingdom of God they believed the gospel when they heard it they were baptized in Jesus name but they still weren't saved even poor Simon he believed too he must be saved also. No. You go to verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Who was given the keys to the kingdom? And what was he supposed to do? Loose. Right? But this is eight years later. Up to this point, Samaritans could believe if they wanted to, but they wasn't getting the Holy Ghost. It hadn't been loosed yet. It was still bound. So they sent for Peter and John, and when they uh, were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So believing doesn't mean you have the Holy Ghost. It, it saddens me, really. It saddens me when people claim that they are saved because I believe on Jesus. But that doesn't mean you have the Holy Ghost just because you believe. Matter of fact, when it came down to the, the disciples of John the Baptist, the apostle asked, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So just believing doesn't mean you have it. But there are those today that are being taught, all you got to do is believe. And you listen to them at the end of the sermon, they give the altar call, and they say, now, just repeat after me. Lord, I believe. 
I, I, I'm a sinner and I can't make it without you. Come into my heart. And then when they get finished, now you're saved. No, that's got absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it say what you should say to get saved. But it does tell you what should happen after you get saved. It tells us that. So Peter and John pray for them. And then verse 16. It says for as yet he. Now he that is talking about is the Holy Ghost. He was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Baptism isn't the Holy Ghost. Belief isn't the Holy Ghost. You must have both. The Bible says that in John, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in St. John chapter 3, except a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Isn't that what he told him? But then he goes further because Nicodemus gets a little philosophical with him, I guess you could say. And he said, no, Jesus clarifies it. Unless you're born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter. You can't even see the kingdom of God. You can read your Bible, but you're not going to see the kingdom of God. That's what's so dangerous about us going out and grabbing folks books because Amen. they wrote a great book about the Bible. I know they don't have the Holy Ghost, but they wrote a great Amen. book. How can they write a great book about something they can't even see? Amen. Something is wrong with that. You can't see the kingdom of God, but you're going to write and tell me about it? Amen. We can tell them about it. You know why? Because we're in it. Amen. But what can they tell us? All right, let's, let's, let's just go on then. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now, it took Peter to come and open the door for the Samaritans to receive the Holy Ghost. The Samaritans are some of Israel that was captured and they had children. They, they were, for in modern terms, they were half-breeds, half-Jew, half-Gentile. Now, the Jews hated the Gentiles, but they would live in the same city as the Gentiles. They would just separate themselves off into a, another section of the city, and only Jewish people could live there. But when it came to the Samaritans, they hated them so much, they would walk way out of the way to even avoid a Samaritan city. They didn't even want to even come near them. So rumors had spread that the Samaritans had heard the word of God. They, they heard it, but they still haven't received the Holy Ghost because nobody had the keys to the kingdom to loose it but Peter. Once he opened the door, it's open now. Right, right. Up to this point, all the Jews that wanted to get the Holy Ghost could get it, but nobody else. Now he opens the door. Now the Samaritans can get it. And let me show you something about this. In verse 18, and when Simon saw that through laying on of hands the apost of the, the apostles, I'm sorry. When Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered money, saying, "Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now, just stop there for a moment. He already had these people bewitched. He already had them thinking that he was some great one of God. If, if by receiving the Holy Ghost, all you had to do was repeat after the preacher, he could have kept right on deceiving them. Couldn't he? He already had them tricked. He could have just kept right on going. Let the apostles leave and pick right up where he left off and say, now, nah, all you all have to do is just repeat after me what I'm saying and you've got the Holy Ghost. And he could get money off of them. Yeah. 
So something happened. When they laid their hands on him, that Simon could not duplicate. It had to be. He was a sorcerer. And, and look at how Peter describes him. Uh, verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Now, he's throwing some pretty heavy stuff down on this fellow. You pretty bad. Your heart's wicked. You a terrible person. I perceive that uh, you're in the gall of bitterness. And you got some pretty terrible things going on in your head, brother. You think that you can just buy this? You can't buy God. You know why? Because God doesn't need anything that we have. Amen. You can't offer him a thing Amen. that he wants. Now, you can give him something, but God doesn't ask for anything. Amen. Let me be clear about that because I know when I'm done, somebody's going to come up and say, so, but, but the Lord said he wants us to be holy. Yes, that's what he requires from us. Um, where's this scripture that says about um, our bodies being a living sacrifice? Romans 12. Romans 12 what? 12, 1. What does it say? I beseech. <laughs> You're right. The, the, the two of you that quoted it, you're right. He said, I beseech you that you present your body a living sacrifice. That is your reasonable service. It is not what God said, I need. He said, give me this and I'll give you something. But God is not in the, in the business of having to take anything from anyone. Yeah. See, that's what, that's what um, Cain did. Cain brought to God what he wanted to give God. But God's not in the business of just taking anything. Abel gave God what he wanted, what God asked for. Abel gave it to him, and God accepted it. But even with that, God didn't need Abel's sacrifice. What does he need with a dead animal? That didn't help God, it helped Abel. Let me, let me say it like this, because sometimes we get this all messed up. We'll go to work and we act like we can hold them hostage. But they don't need us. We need the money. I tried that once. I got cute. Me and a group of us, there was five employees working there. And we said, if all of us threaten to quit, the owner then, he'll do what we say. Because he don't want to shut this, this place down. So we went and told him, you think he, uh, you think he cared what we said? Oh, no. He wasn't having, we wasn't going to hold him hostage. Within a couple of days, there were not a single person working there. And you know what he did? Hired some other folks to work there. They trained them, and that business is still open today. I drive by every now and then, cars all outside in front of it. If you think that you can hold God hostage, we're mistaken. I needed the paycheck. I was the one that hurt myself by doing that. Not just myself, I hurt my family too. Because they was depending on my money coming in so they could eat. 
That was just a dumb thing I did. I know that's a bad word to use today. I'm saying it about me, though. That was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. I needed what they had. And let me tell you, I paid for it, too. I went right out and got another job. Right out. I mean, within a week, I was working. And it was a miserable time I had on that new job. Oh, you don't know. I dreaded getting up in the morning. I dreaded heading into work. I hated it. I'd get there, my stomach would be hurting. I hated it so much. They treated me bad. But you know whose fault it was? Mine. I did that. So all I'm saying is we might think that we're doing God a favor by giving him something. But we're not. He already laid out what it is he's looking for. Now, you don't have to give it to him if you don't want to. But if you don't, he doesn't need it anyway. You're not helping God. You're helping you when you do that. He said, be holy. You're not helping God by being holy. You're helping yourself. Because if God wanted to, he can snuff it all back out of existence and still be holy all by himself. Amen. He don't need us at all. Amen. So everything he asks of us is not something he needs. It's something that we need. Amen. All right. He tells this man. You, you've missed it, brother. You're a terrible person. Yes, ma'am. She said, describe the gall of bitterness. Now, gall was something that they used. Um, when Jesus was dying on the cross, they gave him gall. And, I'll, and I know that a lot of times we look at that and say that it was a terrible thing that they did. But gall was a vinegar type of product. And vinegar is somewhat of an anesthetic. But it's a bitter thing to drink. So he's telling him, I can see that your problem is you got bitterness in your life. You just are. Have you ever heard the expression, you're a miserable person? Yeah. This is what he's telling him. You're just miserable. You're a bitter person. He, whatever was driving him to be the way he was, was just was bad. And so he said, I, I perceive that you're. In the gall of bitterness, you, you're bitter even in the way you present yourself. You're bad. And we see that in people from time to time. There are some Amen. folks that are just driven by power, Amen. that are driven by money. Mm -hmm. Everything they do, they've got nothing nice to say about anybody. Amen. Their whole life is driven by that. I, had a, I heard a preacher say this one time because one of the saints was really clowning and he was going on and on and on and making a big issue out of the way things used to be in the churches and he just wouldn't let it go. And finally the pastor told him, brother, you can either get better or you can get bitter. Right. He was being driven by bitterness. Yeah. And just for clarification on that, he was upset for the way things used to be in the church. It was strict. It was strict. Even when I first got the Holy Ghost, it was strict. You didn't come to church just anyway. You didn't just do certain things out in the street. You didn't go to no movies. Better not sing a commercial on TV. That's worldly music. You can do that. Don't tap your feet. If you're in the doctor's office and they're playing a worldly song, don't tap your feet. Now, we thought that was strict, but I can remember my grandmother saying when she first got saved, sisters had to wear cotton stockings. Your dress had to hang down so many inches from the floor. Now, they didn't do it in this church, but in Indianapolis, at one of the churches there, they had a sister, the ushers would be back there with yardsticks. And when you walked in, they'd have a yardstick, and if your dress was above 18 inches, they told you go home and get and dress proper. It was tough. You didn't go to bed with your husband unless you was trying to have children. 
Yeah, it was tough. Oh, you think we got you think we got it hard. <laughs> oh no. We live in a good life today. He was just bitter over this. He just, every time he would say something about apostolic, oh, I can't remember when he'd just go on and on and on. And finally the pastor had to just stop him, brother. Either you're going to get better or you're going to get bitter. But you can't keep going like you are and remain the same. You, you got to do something. He, he had a bad attitude about it. So that's what he's talking about here with the gall of bitterness. This is somebody that's got an axe to grind. Somebody that's just got a nasty attitude. So then the apostles is rebuking. The apostle Peter is rebuking him. Now, he didn't just leave him hanging out there. Um, in verse 24, then answered Simon and said, pray ye that the Lord, or pray ye the Lord to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So the man had, he realized he messed up. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, it wasn't until after they went to this village and Peter opened the door that now they could go out and start preaching to all the Samaritans. It wasn't until that point. Up to then, only the Jews. Peter loosed it. Then, in Acts chapter 10, now this is two years later, a full two years later, after the Samaritans received the Holy Ghost and the apostles are gone from the cities of Samaria, And 10 and verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So we got Peter again, don't we? And the word being preached and the Holy Ghost fallen. In verse 45, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Up to this point, Gentiles didn't have it. Only the Jews and the Samaritans. Now, they're surprised because God has poured out the Holy Ghost on the Gentiles too. Now, let me just back up to the same question I asked before about Simon. If all they had to do is just confess with their mouth and believe in their heart, then why would they be astonished? All they're doing is just repeating what the apostles told them to say. Why would they be astonished? Because it was something that could not be duplicated by man. Again. Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Now the Holy Ghost is being poured out. How do we know that they have the Holy Ghost? Because they heard them speak with tongues. That's something man can't do. Now man can speak in other languages, but the Apostle Paul gives us three examples of speaking in tongues. There's the the tongue, I'm sorry, two examples. I, I said three, two. The tongue of men and of angels. He said, though, I think it's in the 13th chapter of Corinthians. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels. So angels have a language and people have a language. But unless God moves and does it and it's unknown to you, then all you're doing is just speaking in a different language, not an unknown tongue. Had it just been them speaking another language, then everybody that's bilingual or better has got the Holy Ghost. And just for clarification, I think if you work in the medical profession or the, the 
IT profession, they got their own language too. Half the yeah. stuff they say, you don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. They calling off acronyms and yeah. all kinds of speaking Latin and all that. You don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. I was just down visiting Sister Dolores today. I looked on the, her board, her information board. I said, I can't understand half of the stuff that they've got written on your board. It, it was acronyms and stuff that didn't make any sense to me. It makes sense to them. All right. So I'm just saying, you know, maybe if you work in IT or you work in medicine, you're bilingual. I'm trying to help us out a little bit. Now that Peter, 10 years after Acts 2.38, 10 years later, the Gentiles now have started to receive the Holy Ghost. And you know what? Up to this point, it had been bound. And it took Peter to loose it. Because that's what Jesus said. Whatsoever you loose, shall be loosed. And whatsoever you bind, shall be bound. Until Peter loosed it, it was remaining bound. And that brother had to be shooken up a little bit to get him to go loose it for the Gentiles. Right. Oh, not me, Lord. <laughs> Nothing common or clean has come into my mouth. His brother's going to stand up. He's going to get it right. No. But later on he said, I perceive that the Lord was talking about the Gentiles. Amen. Yes, ma'am. She said, going back to Simon, this was demonic that was upon him, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, this brother, yeah, he's, he's dealing with witchcraft. Yeah, sorcery. He, he's... He, he's uh, He's dabbling in things that some of us think is funny and cute, right. but it ain't. No. You know, when my kids was coming up, that was when the Harry Potter movies was really popular. And some of the saints was asking me, you know, you, do you let your kids read the Harry Potter books? I said, nope. Oh, come on. Nope. Then the movies came out. And I had saints asking me. Can your kids go uh, to, to see Harry Potter with my kids? I said, nope. absolutely not. <laughs> well, why? It's a kid's movie. I said, the Bible says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. My children are not going to look at something that God says should be put to death. Look at it as if it's something to be admired. Yeah. It won't happen as long as I'm over them. They're not going to go watch it. Right. So I wouldn't let them read the books. I wouldn't let them watch the movies. Now, somebody else took them without my knowledge and let them look at one of them. They said, oh, it's a, it's a good thing. It teaches friendship and togetherness. I was furious. I said, my children will never come to your house again. Never. And this was family. As long as they're under 18, they will not come to your house. Well, you can be mad at me, but don't punish them. I said, oh, no, you punished them. Because you knew, I already told you no. And you snuck and did it. So, they on punishment from your house, never going there again. I don't know that they ever went back. Did you? She don't know. There. Yes, ma'am. She said the reason why she brought this up is because Simon was more in love with himself and what he could get than he was in love with the things of God. He did, never received the greater power. And you're right, the scripture never talks about him again after that. He, he was messed up. He really was. But again, that brings up another good point. A lot of times we feel like if God does a miracle that it will impress our unsaved family members and they'll want to come and get saved. Lord, if you just do this, I know they'll believe. No, no Simon stood and watched the miracles. It said that they did miracles and signs. He saw all of that, but what was within him stayed in him. His heart was wrong. He was a part of it until they did something he couldn't do. Then it's like, oh, wait a second, this is going to mess up my game. What do, how do I, I buy that. Miracles don't save anybody. And we shouldn't go to God, Lord, if you just do this, then they'll believe. No, they won't. 
Seeing hell won't make them believe. Seeing miracles won't make them believe. Right. It's not going to do it. Right. You know what miracles does? Miracles help those that are ready to believe right. to be stronger in their belief. Yeah. Remember the part where the man came to Jesus and he said, I believe, Lord, help thou my unbelief. He already had belief. He said, but now, if you do this, that's going to strengthen my belief. It's going to help my belief. So, miracles help those who already have the Holy Ghost. It strengthens our faith and our knowledge and belief in God. But for the world, miracles ain't going to do anything. Yes, sir. His question is dealing with Peter having the keys to the kingdom and the fact that uh, when he came to the Samaritans, he laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. But with the Gentiles, he just came to them and preached and they received the Holy Ghost. And does this have, is this saying anything about how Peter is using the keys to the kingdom to help people get saved? It wasn't him laying hands on them that saved them. It wasn't that. That helped stir them, but it was their repentance. Peter was the only one that could loose it, though. So him coming there is what loosed it. I mean, is, remember, Peter and John both are praying for them and laying hands on them, and they received it. So Peter had to be there. He was the catalyst. He was the key to all of it. He didn't have to go and preach to all of them, in every city. He just needed to open it initially. So by him showing up to where the Samaritans were, that's when the Holy Ghost started falling on them. When he showed up where the Gentiles were, that's when the Holy Ghost started falling on them. He had to be there. It was his presence that was the key to it. Because if it was just his prayer, he could have stayed in Jerusalem and prayed for him there. He had to come there and then it was open. Yes, sir. Yes, his question is, the, the Gentiles, if he's reading it right, the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost, then were baptized. Yes. And we have people do that even now. Amen. Folks will get the Holy Ghost, and then we got to baptize them. Amen. Sometimes people will go down in the water and come up out the water, right. speaking in tongues. Yes. Sometimes they go down in the water, and it'll take them three weeks of seeking the Lord before they get the Holy Ghost. Sister Doris was five years, four, four years seeking the Lord. She had clothes that she had specially for coming to church and tearing for the Holy Ghost. She did. She'd go home, change her clothes, and put on her... I love that. She put her tearing clothes on, get over here and get to the altar. <laughs> Four years. But that sister got it. Amen. See, sometimes, I, I, me, I couldn't have done it for four years. You was thinking that too? Amen. But God knew what she needed. Now, she would appreciate it far greater than those that got it coming about the water. She worked, she worked, she worked, she worked, and then she worked some more. And then finally, she quit working and repented, and God gave her the Holy Ghost. So she going to remember all that what she did all them years. And you know something that's funny, because once you get it, you think it's so hard. But once you get it, it's like, huh, that wasn't nothing. <laughs> if I would have just... All I had to do, and, and they say it, you know, when you... You down praying or tearing, whatever you're doing. And they, come on, just give up. And you're like, give up? Give up what? And then after you get it, it's like, oh, why didn't they just say give up? You didn't get it. You didn't understand it until after you got it. Then you realize, oh, I was doing all of that for nothing. You ain't got to tear it for the Holy Ghost. All you have to do is just repent. You can be walking down the street. Repent and the Holy Ghost fall on you. Yes. She said she, she sought the Lord three times. 
because every time it would start to come, she would start to resist because she, would, she didn't know what was going on. So she was, she was pulling back because she wanted to get it together, I guess. <laughs> wanted to figure out what was going on before you did it. Amen. Well, that's, that's the thing. We say that. Well, now that you have it, you realize all I had to do was give in. But before that, ooh, I'm not sure what this is. And so we get nervous. We get a little scared. It, all it takes, and I remember, I can't, I don't remember the, it was Bishop Herman said he had witnessed to the woman that was going to be his wife and they were going, I don't know if they were heading to church, but they were somewhere in the car and the Holy Ghost fell on her while they were in the car. He talking to her about the Lord and she just, she received the Holy Ghost right then and there. Yeah, some, there was a pastor that was, I'm not sure where he was from, but I remember Elder Scott telling us about him. Before he became a pastor, before he received the Holy Ghost, he was working in a hardware store. And he, would, he was seeking after God. He didn't know what he was doing. He just loved God. And he said the, the manager would come over to him because he'd be down in the basement speaking in tongues. He said the owner would come by and tell him, hey, stop all that down there and get back to work. Because he didn't, he didn't even know what he had. And he said one day he was just walking down the street and a man stopped him while he was walking and said, do you have the Holy Ghost? He said, I don't even know what that is. The man started describing it to him. He said, that's what I've been doing. Then it dawned on him. What he, had. he had the Holy Ghost and didn't even know. Yes, ma'am. She said before she received the Holy Ghost, she knew she wanted something, but she didn't even know what it was. You just wanted God but didn't know what all that meant. Yes, ma'am. Very, very true. She said a lot of our resistance against God or the Holy Ghost comes from our, uh, comes from society and the things that society teaches. And we have to understand everything. And, and you're right. Most of the anti-God things in the church even now are from society. And they're telling us, you don't have to have nobody tell you what to do. Well, you do if you want to get to heaven. I didn't make that up. The Bible says that. They'll tell you, ah, you don't have to go give your money to that preacher. Well, you're not. You're giving it to God, and that's what the Bible says you have to do. It is not the preacher. It's the Bible. Now, the ones that's getting on and begging for money for jet planes and all that kind of stuff, that's not Bible. That's something else. They, I just read where some preacher was on line and he was, he was on television crying and begging the people to give more money so he could get a jet. Well, I might try that here. <laughs> Let me hurry up. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, this loosing and binding is not dealing with salvation. This loosing and binding is dealing with judgment in the church. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take, him, uh, take with thee one or two more, that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen, as a heathen man and a publican. Boy, the tax collector really got a bad name. <laughs> 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto thee that if two or three uh, if, uh, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that ye shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. This is one of the most twisted, misused scriptures in the Bible. He is not talking about two or three folks getting together and binding uh, the devil on your job. 
He's not talking about two or three getting together, touching and agreeing that God give you a job or that you get a new car or that the Lord heals somebody. It's got nothing to do with this. All of this is based around judgment. If somebody doesn't act right and you go talk to them about it and they still acting ugly. Now, let me just tell you right now. We have it set up a different, slightly different than this. Don't go get two of your friends and go to them. Bring them right on in the office. Man. We'll skip over the middleman because most of your friends are just going to take your side anyway. That's not going to do anything but make it worse. You're just going to inflame the situation. Bring them straight on in the office and we'll get it straightened out. There's times when saints will come to me and say, well, so-and-so did this to me. And I say, well, um, well, let's bring them in and talk to them. Oh, no, don't say nothing to them. I said, well, then what can I do? You just come in to complain, that's all. <laughs> Amen. I mean, I can, I can tell you I feel bad for you. They shouldn't have done you like that. But until I hear both sides, I don't know what to tell you. Okay, never mind. Don't say nothing. All right. But in judgment, some folks get mad. Since I've been the pastor of Christ Temple, I've had folks get mad in the office and go straight out and take their matter to the court. Because they didn't like what I said. So they took it to the court to let the judge sort out to give them what they wanted. And you know, unfortunately, there are times when the court will give you what you want and it's not the right thing. Amen. Yeah. We taking our brothers and sisters to court. Apostle Paul rebuked them for that. Amen. Don't you know we're going to judge angels and y'all can't judge small things like this? Right. God has judgment set up in the church for matters like that. Amen. That's why he said go get two or three brothers. So, well, instead of that, we have deacons. If it's something that's really crazy, I'll, get, I'll get grab a couple of my deacons and we'll sit down and hear the matter and I'll give the judgment. Now, here's the thing. You can run out if you want to. But then you throw yourself in the hands of God. And I'm not trying to scare anybody and I'm not trying to tell nobody because there are times I've had people come in the office and I say, this goes beyond my pay grade. You need to go take this somewhere else. I'm not going to judge. That is, if, if you're driving down the street and you hit something with your car and you come to me for judgment, I can't help you. That's a worldly thing. That's a natural thing. But if two of the saints have a dispute with each other, now that's the territory that I can make a judgment on. So don't be down at Cracker Barrel and one of the saints hit your car and you come to me and say, Pastor, they hit my car and you need to make them do this. That's... That's why I, then when I tell them, that goes beyond my pay grade. You need to go find your insurance agent, and you tell them, get the police and have a report filled out, and you need to go through the process. Because that's not a spiritual matter. But with spiritual things, yes. God has it set up in his church to deal with spiritual issues. And you want to run to the court, then you have man's judgment on you and not God's. All right? So when he's talking about two or three gathered together in my name, he's talking about in the matter of judgment in the church over spiritual things. When he says what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, he's talking about the pastor and his deacons. If, that, if it gets that high, if, if he looses it, then it's loosed. Amen. This is not talking about loosing thin, things that are sinful and making it okay. Right. It's not like that. But if one saint says, Pastor, that's I always sit on the front row in that spot. And now so-and-so is sitting there in my spot. And they know that's where I sit. So they bring them up in the office. And I say, Brother, there's not a seat in this building that belongs to you. If you don't get here early enough, that's just you. You missed it. If somebody else sits there... You just missed it. That's all. Now, you can walk out angry with me. But it's been loosed. 
God's okay with that. If I tell him, brother, you know, you're doing it to be spiteful and mean. And I'm telling you, don't sit in that spot no more. And then I come out and you're sitting in the spot. Now you're in trouble with God. Because that's been bound now. That's what he's talking about. Now, I know I'm just using a little silly thing to demonstrate that. But you understand the point. What is bound in judgment at the church is bound in heaven. What has been loosed in judgment in the church is loosed in heaven. You can walk around upset because you feel like the pastor should have bound it. You can walk around like that if you want to. But, but God's not going to be moved because you're angry. Your pastor should be spiritual. Man. The judgment should be unctioned by the Holy Ghost. Man. Because I'm not a mind reader. No pastor is. But God is. Man. And once God gives the pastor the judgment, then that's it. Now it's bound. Or it's loosed. Does that make sense? All right. Any questions? School's back in. We're going to get out. All right. Stand on your feet.